Welcome. We're happy you could join us today. I'm Joyce Lights. I'm Executive Director of Connecticut Audubon Society. With your support, we can remain a conservation leader across the state. Programs like this really help to build awareness of birds and our environment. And so we want to thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight's presentation is discussing one of our most engaging owls, the snowy owl. Now for some basic housekeeping. Everyone will be muted throughout the presentation. We ask that you use the chat for questions. Um, you can activate the closed captions by going to more and selecting captions. We recommend using speaker view for the best viewing experience. You can find that in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. We'll be recording the presentation this evening and a link will be set to all, sent to all of our subscribers. Now I'd like to introduce Stefan Martin. Stefan's our conservation manager. He's an avid birder, experienced sanctuary manager, and has been inspired by snowy owls. Stefan, thank you for leading this important conversation tonight. Of course. Thank you for the introduction, Joyce. Um, so we have a fantastic evening uh, scheduled for everybody here. Um, obviously, snowy owls are just an absolutely magnificent bird and one that actually um, helped re-spark my interest in conservation. Back in 2014, it was January, so uh, almost 10 years ago, um, actually 10 years ago, almost to the day, um, we had a, a eruption of snowy owls, which we'll hear a little bit about in a little bit. Um, and I went up to the Milford area uh, at dusk to uh, attempt to see some of these snowy owls flying over the marsh and just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Not only did I get to enjoy some of these snowy owls, but also saw a thick-billed muir, uh, which is a rare bird for our state. And that kind of re-sparked this passion of birding and bird watching in me. And I think without that, I'm, I'm not sure if I would be in the position I am now um, in a conservation role in the state of Connecticut. So that's just my quick anecdote. And I'm sure everybody here has um, a couple other stories as well to share. Um, so tonight's speaker is Rebecca McKay, PhD, and tonight she'll be highlighting her research with snowy owls and give an overview on what she and the rest of the team over at Project Snowstorm have been learning over the past decade. She received a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology at Millersville University and a Master's in Biology at East Stroudsburg University, studying the nesting behavior of broadwing hawks in Pennsylvania. In 2021, she received a PhD from McGill University in Montreal, where she studied wintering snowy owls. Rebecca is a research biologist at the Hawk Mount Sanctuary in Pennsylvania and joined the staff full-time at Hawk Mount in May of 2021. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I, we, we were able to uh, speak a little bit before this program and certainly uh, got me excited for what you have to share tonight. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Make sure everyone can see. All right, looking okay on your end? That looks great. Perfect, okay. All right, so let me just change my little laser pointer here too so you can see when I'm pointing at things. <laughs> Maybe it won't do it. Okay, I don't think it will, but you can still see the arrow, right? Okay, wonderful. And let me do this. Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation from the Connecticut Audubon. Uh, I'm very honored to present um, a part of the, the uh, series this evening and a big thanks to everyone for uh, tuning into my talk. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the work that myself and my colleagues have been doing studying this magnificent uh, species that you see here on your screen. But before I dive into all things snowy owls, Tom did ask that I share a little bit of my story and sort of how I got started studying raptors. So here's a couple photos of a, a young Rebecca. Um, I always loved animals growing up. Um, I loved uh, just interacting with them. I really enjoyed nature, but I really was a city kid and really wasn't exposed to the outdoors that much. And once I got to the age where I needed to figure out what I needed to do with my life. Um, just like a lot of other kids, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So 
I went to university and I stayed undeclared for my first two years. I thought I was going to go into communications or journalism. Um, and then I ended up taking a couple of environmental classes that really piqued my interest. So I finally declared my major in the sciences. And this was completely, utterly overwhelming. <laughs> um, I was overwhelmed by the course load, uh, the feeling that I wasn't smart or good enough to be in the sciences. And on top of that, my G GPA was actually suffering because I was taking physics and chemistry and botany all while working full time as a waitress to pay for uh, college on my own. But lucky for me, um, I actually had um, an incredible, incredible mentor, Dr. John Wallace, and he saw something in me. He encouraged me to focus on my goals of becoming a biologist, and that meant reducing my hours at work and starting to get some real field experience. Um, and to do that, I needed to connect with local uh, conservation and wildlife organizations. And so I listened to Dr. Wallace and I did just that. So for his suggestion, I reached out to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary located here in Northeastern Pennsylvania for various volunteer opportunities. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Hawk Mountain, it's actually the first refuge for birds of prey in the world. It was established in 1934 by, Dr. Or by Rosalie Edge, and it sits along the Kittatinny Ridge, which is this forested mountain chain um, that is part of the Appalachian Mountain Range. And it's a really beautiful place to be, as you can see from the video there. Um, it's a migration highway for about 16 uh, raptor species, many other birds and insects. And if you never visited, I would encourage you to make the four plus hour drive. I looked it up from Hartford to the sanctuary. It's about four hours. Um, and come visit us during fall um, when you get to see around 18,000 different migrating raptors. So I immediately fell in love with Hawk Mountain and the work they were doing, and I wanted to be more involved. So after I completed my bachelor's degree, I became a conservation science trainee here, um, while also starting my master's uh, studying broadwing hawks. And it was basically at this point that I realized I wanted to continue working with raptors. The time that I spent out in the forest searching for nests, sitting quietly monitoring the adults and their young as they grew, and then, of course, capturing and tagging these birds and putting GPS trackers on them to follow them throughout their annual life cycle was really, really cool. And I was hooked. So I wanted to be immersed in everything, all things raptors. So I also participated in a one week um, raptor field techniques course that was taught by the wonderful Jean Jacobs in Wisconsin. And it's really cool because I now have the privilege of co-teaching the same type of course here at Hawk Mountain, where folks get to come and learn about all the different ways we study and monitor raptors. But that course in particular was extra special for me because that's where I had my first encounter with a snowy owl. So fast forward to 2017 and I'm joining the team at Project Snowstorm. I recently finished my master's and was sort of pondering my next move. And um, it actually happened that one day I went up to North Lookout and was sitting there kind of enjoying fall migration with my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. J.F. Therien, seen there with that orange arrow pointing at his head. Um, we were just discussing my career path and he asked me if I was interested in doing a PhD on snowy owls. Who can say no to that? <laughs> so I said, yes, of course. I joined this Project Snowstorm crew and I started my PhD at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, where I got to analyze um, all of the amazing tracking data that was collected by Project Snowstorm before I joined, um, as well as other collaborators working with snowy owls. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Project Snowstorm, it's actually one of the world's largest collaborative research projects focusing on the winter ecology of snowy owls. And it's a great group of people of over 40 plus collaborators. Um, we're a team of scientists and banders and wildlife vets. Um, and this, this organization came together. Um, it was founded in 2013 alongside that really big eruption year um, that some of you might remember quite well, as Stefan mentioned. 
So the snowy owl, it pulls at our heartstrings, um, but we have to remember it's a fierce predator that plays a really important role in Arctic ecosystems. They nest on the open tundra and they feed on these cute little guys here called lemmings. And in years when there's a high abundance of lemmings on the Arctic breeding grounds, snowy owls will lay larger clutch sizes and in turn have more young produced. And so a great example of this is actually of this photo here, which shows um, about 70 or so lemmings, they were counted, um, surrounding, we can see here, um, the eggs of the snowy owl, and actually one of them did hatch, so there's a chick, um, you know, surrounding, uh, surrounding the nest mound. And so this is a year where there's tons of lemmings, lots of food for the little owlets as they grow up, um, so meaning that their chances of survival will be much higher. So here in North America, in years where many snowy owls are produced up in the Canadian Arctic, we sometimes get these things called winter eruptions. And as I mentioned, it's the years where there's a lots of lemmings, lots of young produce, the clutch sizes are larger, and all of these young birds will now migrate south and winter alongside us humans. You can find them in open habitats and grasslands along coastlines. Um, and this like migration phenomena has been occurring and documented by humans, uh, I wanna say for almost two centuries now. So uh, I think the first one was documented in the early 1800s. And so this is a real treat when it happens. A lot of us birders and researchers um, get really excited. It's, it's a treat for all of us to see snowy owls this far south. So as I mentioned, the researchers, the banders were extra excited to see our favorite Arctic owl at these latitudes. Um, having the owls this far south allows for a low cost opportunity to trap and band owls. Uh, when you think about traveling to the Arctic, what that entails, um, it's quite costly and can be very challenging to work with owls up in that landscape. So once we identify where the owls are and we trap them, we try to gather as much information as we can. We have this wild bird in hand and we want to learn from it as much as we possibly can. So we're measuring the bird, we're weighing the bird, we're looking at its molt, we're looking at its fat, its body condition, does it have any ectoparasites? Um, so we collect all that information, and then for some individuals that are of the appropriate weight and body condition, we'll affix these really cool GPS, GSM tracking devices to them. And kind of like your cell phone, it tracks where you go, so it gets a coordinate for your locations, um, and it sends that back, and we're able to get on our computer and see where this bird has been. And this GPS device is attached what we call through the backpack harness method. And so we basically affix it to a non-abrasive material called spectra or Teflon. And then we basically put it on the owl like a backpack. Um, this device here is one of our um, Argos devices and it has an antenna. Most of our devices don't have the antenna because uh, the owls tend to pull that off sometimes. But basically to give you an idea that this, these transmitters can weigh about as much as your average chicken egg. So for my PhD research, I focus strictly on that overwintering period when some snowy owls migrate south into human dominated landscapes. And the winter period accounts for over half of the bird's annual cycle. And few studies have really examined winter behavior of snowy owls, making this pretty important research to fill in the knowledge gaps of their ecology. So one of the big questions we wanted to tackle was survival. We wanted to know what the causes of death were for wintering owls. And then we also want to know if survival differed for those young birds wintering um, at our latitudes in eruptive years. So years when there's an abundance of owls on the landscape, um, compare that to um, non-eruptive years, so years when there are less owls on the landscape, meaning less competition. And so to do this, we looked uh, at survival from individual tag owls with GPS. So we had about 185 birds that um, were tracked with telemetry over the years. Um, and this includes the Project Snowstorm owls, as well as owls that were tagged by other collaborators. So we estimated winter survival for these GPS tagged owls, and then we compared these causes of mortality to over 350 necropsied owls that were turned into vet facilities in Eastern North America um, since as far back as 2013. 
And so what we found was that anthropogenic mortality was almost two times greater than natural mortality, with the top causes of human-related deaths being collisions. So this includes automobile collisions, airplane collisions, other types of collisions, whether that's with buildings or structures, um, and then, of course, electrocution. And so you can see here from this table um, the two, two groupings of the telemetry owls and the necropsied owls, and you can kind of compare the percentages. And although we had a smaller sample size of telemetry tracked owls, um, our percentages are pretty much the same um, as the necropsied owls. So I think this kind of gave us a really good indicator of owls that were being turned in and the owls that we were tracking um, were all dying from the same sort of types of, of causes. So we also wanted to see at what point in the winter uh, mortality was occurring. Um, and so what we did is we compared adult mortality with immature mortality. And if you kind of just follow this graph here, you can see that we have the probability of mortality per month on the y-axis, and then just the winter months along the x-axis. And if we look at adults here, we can see that you know mortality, the probability of mortality was actually quite low and constant over the winter period. Whereas in comparison, if we look at the immature birds, we can actually see that the probability of mortality was much greater earlier in the wintering period. And then as the winter progressed, mortality, uh, the probability of mortality kind of really started to decrease. And we think that there might be, you know, the reason for this um, with greater mortality in early winter, maybe that you have a bunch of new young owls on the landscape and they face, you know, much bigger threats. They're trying to navigate learn what a vehicle is, learn what an airport is. Um, and so they just may be at greater risk um, until they really learn what's in their environment. So as mentioned, we also wanted to compare survival for immature birds in eruptive versus non-eruptive birds. And to do this, we had to determine what eruptive years were, um, right? In science, you kind of have to have you have to back everything up for what you're trying to, the questions you're trying to ask and why you're asking them. And so what we did is we went to Christmas bird count data, um, this amazing, wonderful, um, long-term community science um, that's been going on over the years. And we went in and we extracted all of the snowy owl data from 23 different states and provinces in both the US and Canada. And we were able to um, map snowy owl abundance to see really when it peaked and then when it dropped. And so if you kind of focus on the red dots highlighted in orange here, um, these are the years that we deemed um, eruptive. And so we define those years in which the abundance is higher in one year than in the preceding or following year. And so within our study period, we had six eruptions occurring in Eastern North America. And so I always like to kind of give a shout out to all of you who participate in Christmas bird count. Um, I know sometimes going out in December and January, it's cold, maybe the weather's not great, um, but in the end, um, hopefully it's an enjoyable experience, but you also are contributing to um, things like this, where we get to take those data and use it to ask these really important questions. So I hope you feel proud of that and, and a part of this research, and thank you. So what we found by comparing um, survival from um, immatures that were wintering here in eruptive versus non-eruptive years was actually that um, uh, those birds coming down in eruptive years had considerably lower survival than those in non-eruptive years. So again, this figure here is just showing survival probability on our y-axis and the number of days starting in November and ending in April, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how survival changes over time in the winter. And we can see with this um, bluish green line that basically survival didn't change. All of the owls in that sample um, did not die. Whereas if we compare the owls from the eruptive year, every time there's a drop, that's when an owl was killed. And another drop and another drop and another drop. And so again, kind of corresponding to that um, graph from uh, two slides ago, we can see that earlier in winter is when mortality is um, occurring. And so survival is decreasing. And then kind of as the uh, winter months progress, maybe the owls are sort of learning the lay of the land and their um, survival probability kind of stays steady or um, increases over time. So in summary, we found that those immature owls that erupt into Eastern North America are limited by density dependent factors, such as competition from other owls, which in turn forces them into risky human dominated landscapes where survival decreases. 
And so this was a study we were able to publish uh, in one of the journals, Ecologia, um, and this is free online. You're welcome to learn more about this study um, and survival of snowy owls. So also as part of my doctorate research and a major research focus for Project Snowstorm, um, this work was inspired um, from earlier work by Smith, Bates, and Fuller. Um, one of our goals was to assess if relocations or translocations are effective at reducing return rates of snowy owls to airport facilities. And we're often asked, you know, why do we always see snowy owls at airports? And um, airports are just attractive habitats for snowy owls, but also other raptor species and other species in general. And so when you think about what an airfield looks at looks like, you can see from just a different perspective here, um, it's open and it's treeless. And when you think about the habitat of a snowy owl, um, we think that this, these airfields might mimic these flat open habitats that resemble the tundra. And um, with you have just the view of that, what that looks like, why it would be something that a snowy owl would be attracted to is, you know, it looks like the tundra, um, but also there's a ton of food there for these birds. Um, so airports are known to have, you know, pretty high populations of small mammals. And this, this combined with how the habitat is makes it a really appealing wintering site that can support multiple overwintering owls as well as other raptors. But that's not great. Um, unfortunately, snowy owls, just like a lot of other larger birds, pose a serious strike risk um, because of their large body size. Um, they have a 1.5 meter wingspan. They weigh, you know, between one and three kilograms. Um, they fly pretty slowly when you compare it to other birds. Um, they hunt closely to the ground and their daily movements um, do occur near uh, a plane's takeoff and landing zones. And so um, as owls hunt along the tarmac or fly from perch to perch, um, they're exposed to these risks, including collision, but also jet blast as well. And unfortunately, they do get hit. Um, the Federal Aviation Administration has reported over 250 snowy owl aircraft collisions from over 55 airports in both the US and Canada. And and um, an estimated cost of about $2.8 million in damage has been reported. Um, of course, this is not every owl is reported. Um, some, some may go unnoticed. Um, some, the amount of damage may not be accounted for. This is just an estimate from the database that we had access to. Um, but unfortunately, these owls are being killed. Um, and because they're a risk, uh, both private industry and federal wildlife agencies actually have been capturing and relocating snowy owls for many years. Um, with that ultimate goal of mitigating strikes and reducing the threats to air safety. So um, with Project Snowstorm and other collaborators, we decided to look at how relocations um, to see if they were successful or not. And so over the years, owls were trapped at different airports in the US and Canada. Um, and we went as far back as 2000 um, with some of our collaborators works, uh, the work they did. And of those owls, we had 42, about 21 adults and 21 in, uh, immatures that were affixed with these transmitters here. And they were released um, at various sites away from the airfield. And so here's just a map giving you uh, a little view, a glimpse of what that looked like. Um, so of course we have all of the airports in these orange plane symbols. Um, so we had 13 airports in this study. And then all of the black dots are the relocation sites for all of those 42 different owls. And then the little hatched line is just showing that um, from the airport here, this owl was released here. And again, here and here, some that were released very, very close to the airport. And we just wanted to compare um, what the relocation sites were like and um, if they influenced whether a snowy owl would return. All right, so we found a couple different things. Um, we actually found that distance played a factor and a role on whether an owl would return. We have this figure here, um, which is just showing whether the bird returned or it did not return, and then distance on the um, x-axis. And we can see that all these little points are basically for individual birds. So all of these points here saying snowy owls returned, kind of returned when an owl was released closer to the airport. So say someone was like, we're gonna release the bird 10 kilometers away. 
Well, that's really nothing for a snowy owl. They can, they can do that, move that distance quite easily. So what we found that as the further you remove and uh, relocate a bird from the airport, the less likely it would be to return. And we kind of found a sweet spot, which we don't know if it's, um, you know, it's, it's likely not the case for every owl and at every airport, but if you move the bird more than 100 kilometers from the airport it was trapped at, um, it reduces its probability of returning quite a bit. We also found um, that what the habitat was like and the land cover was like at the relocation site, that that also influenced on whether an owl would return. And so we found that um, relocation sites that had uh, more uh, croplands and more wetlands within them, that the owl would be less likely to return. And interestingly, we also found that um, immature females and adult males were less likely to return than adult females and immature males. And so again, you're kind of thinking like, why would that be important? Um, for snowy owls and like a lot of our other raptors, um, the females are larger in size. And so they're often more dominant. And what'll happen is those adult females will sort of stake their territory and claim it and defend it. And so it sort of makes sense that those female owls would, would wanna come back because it's a good habitat. There's plenty of food. They wanna get everybody else out of there so they can stay. Whereas the immature females, again, in the kind of a little bit lower in the hierarchy, as well as the adult males, so they don't want to compete with the adult female. And then you have those immature males, which are, you know, the, the most submissive of the group, and they'll do a lot of wandering and they won't um, really compete as much. And so that kind of matched up um, with what our hypothesis was. But the really great thing is we found within this study that um, relocation had a 67% success rate. So of our 42 owls, only a third returned to the airport. And this is really encouraging when you think about the time and the energy and the money that goes into um, trapping owls on the airfield and relocating them, um, that this might actually be um, worthwhile doing and something that we should encourage um, all of the wildlife agencies and private industry to be doing um, at their airports. So just learning about owls and airports, um, we also were just kind of curious about how long it takes for an owl to uh, return to the airport after it's been relocated. So like I mentioned, of those 42 owls, um, about 14 of them did return after uh, being relocated. And we wa under wanted to understand why and how long and what uh, factors may have influenced that. And so here's just an example of one of the birds that we relocated. Um, it was trapped at the Montreal Pierre Elliott Trudeau International Airport. And um, we trapped it, we put a transmitter on it, and we relocated it here. And then you could see the yellow star is the area of release. And then we could kind of watch the bird as it kind of moseys around and then crosses over the St. Lawrence. You know, we think, okay, maybe it's gonna go south. And then it ends up kind of moving through the farm fields all around. We're like, okay, maybe it'll stay here. And then we see this happen and then we start to bite our nails and go, oh no, please don't do it. And then the bird goes right back to the airport. And this happened, um, these movements that you see here was just one week after being relocated. And we haven't had the chance to, to really dive into this as far as the research side of it goes, but really trying to understand how the owl knows to go back to the airport. Um, there's just some theories that are being kind of tossed around, um, but we haven't quite figured it out because if you think about it, you know, the owl sort of kind of did these movements, but then made its way in the direction of the airport. Um, so what is it queuing in on in the environment? Are there sounds? Are there visual aids? Um, and how did it know to go back there? Because we had individuals that were young of the year. It's their first time being at the airport. It's not like they were there last winter or two winters ago. So they're familiar. They know the lay of the land. Um, it can happen with young birds. And we'll often see from their tracking data that they just like beeline it right back to the airport. So really interesting. Lots of questions come. More questions come with the research that you do. Um, so we'd like to look into this in, in the future. But we did find that it took about two weeks, a little more than two weeks um, for birds to, to make their way back to the airport. We also wanted to take a look at the strike data because this was available from the Federal Aviation Administration's uh, Wildlife Strike Database. And as I mentioned, we had over 250 snowy owls reported um, over a um, about 11 year time frame. 
And so we actually found that the number of strikes varied um, among months. So as I mentioned before, we're setting the winter period. We want to know um, what's the riskiest time for owls when they come this far south. And we actually saw that um, a lot of the birds were reported, um, had reported collisions with aircrafts in December. And this ha was happening on the runways. And so we, again, kind of like our mortality data, we could see that, you know, hey, maybe December is a really good time um, for managers to be out on the airfield trying to trap um, snowy owls and relocate them. And so definitely more work could be done here and the communication with um, airport facilities to really maybe beef up their um, trapping, trapping efforts so that we could in turn um, help mitigate strikes. Again, trying to take as much information out of the database that we could. Um, we also wanted to know, you know, hey, are snowy owls being killed during the daytime or are they being killed at night? Um, a lot of the trapping that happens at the airports, um, it's done actively during the day, but then passively at night. And so can we provide more information um, to try to help, again, help um, increase the efforts um, for, for relocations and, and trapping. And so we did see, uh, we did have a huge number that didn't have any time of day associated with their strike. Um, just over 60% did not have a time of day associated with the incident. Um, but we did have about 24% of the strikes occurring during the daytime hours and 15% of the strikes occurring in the evening hours. So again, not really a huge difference between the two, um, but with I think a larger data set, we might be able to determine, you know, strikes are occurring actually more frequently um, during these hours than those hours. And again, this is just again to boost um, sort of the, the management on the airfield and to try to help prevent strikes. So with transmitter data, we're also able to kind of understand a little bit more about the mortality side of things. Unfortunately, this is more of the sad part, not the happy ending where, you know, the owl's relocated and doesn't return and, you know, ends up not getting killed. But here's two occasions where we did have two of our transmitted owls um, be killed on the airfield. And so um, we were able to learn more about their movements. And we can see here with the yellow star is the last known location, so likely where um, mortality occurred. And I'll just kind of walk you through. On the left, we have one of the owls that was um, relocated from Boston Logan International Airport in Massachusetts. And just from the map here, all those little red dots are all of the GPS pings um, that we received. And we can kind of see that this owl really stayed toward that southern portion of the airfield. However, it was moving around quite a bit, crossing major runways, um, you know, putting itself at risk. And unfortunately, it was killed uh, 19 days later by a jet blast um, after it was relocated and returned. And then on the right, we have uh, movements from an immature ma uh, male that was uh, captured and relocated from Philadelphia International Airport here in Pennsylvania. Again, this bird returned to the airport. We were able to see all of its movements. And we could tell that it really kind of used the entire airport, you know, it was moving, um, you know, onto the side roads and then onto the major runways and then, you know, down on that. And then this end, it really kind of moved all over the airfield. Um, but we can see that um, I think it was about 15 days later after it returned, um, it was struck by a plane off of one of the major runways. So again, thinking about how this information can be useful, um, not only does it let us determine that mortality occurred, um, but also, you know, can we share this information with airport managers to say, hey, this is some of your high risk areas. Um, maybe there are things you can be doing during these certain times of days and these certain months that can help reduce these collisions. So that's really the sad part about airport relocations. And it's always unfortunate when an owl um, doesn't survive. But then there's also the really cool stuff, the really exciting stuff um, that comes from doing this kind of work and kind of gives you that little bit of hope. And so um, this is one future direction that we can take this study um, and really look at the long-term effects of successful translocations. And I just wanted to kind of share this individual as an example. Um, this is one of the birds that we trapped at the Montreal airport and relocated it in Southern Quebec. And this owl actually ended up not returning to the airport, um, instead kind of hung around and then started to move north in the spring and it actually nested in the Ungava Peninsula up here in Northern Quebec and came south again here and wintered in the same area once again. And then the following year, 
went back up and ended up um, spending the summer in Nunavut. And so really cool, super awesome. We get all this really exciting tracking data and it's really special when we get to see, you know, how the birds migrate. And then once they um, end up finding somewhere to breed or spend their summer. But for me, this is like the really, really satisfying stuff is trying to really understand um, the benefits to the work that we're doing when humans are involved in trying to help, um, you know, protect these birds. And so I wanted to highlight the movements of this, this wintering owl. Um, and we'll start with the pink. So if you kind of follow along, you'll see that here's the airport in Montreal. And we uh, relocated the bird. Uh, probably, I want to say it was like closer to 80, 90 kilometers. So it wasn't even over 100, but this bird ended up not going back. And then there's no date or time associated with it, but you can kind of just follow along and see that that rest of that winter it kind of moved around, went along the river, um, kind of zippy dude all around, and then ended up going north. And so we're like, amazing. It didn't go back to an airport. This is great news. It went north. We saw that it nested, all really positive stuff. And then as I mentioned, it came back that following winter. And this is where, you know, again, as you're watching the tracking data come in and you're wondering, oh my gosh, where's this bird gonna go? And we can see that it actually ended up not going near the airport, um, which in some cases we see some of these birds come right back and would do that straight line back to the airport. This individual actually made its way um, not to exactly where it wintered before, um, but within um, that general area. And so did not return to the airport, really great, wonderful news. We're super excited to see that. As I mentioned, the bird went north again and came south for the third year in a row with the tracking device. And I don't have all of the tracking uh, data on here, but the yellow is basically that third winter we were following the bird. And it ended up setting up a smaller territory, um, again, in the same general area in Southern Quebec and did not return to the airport. And so this is just one example. There's a few others from our tagged owls. And when I think of sort of the broader scheme of things for, for relocations, even of birds that don't have transmitters on them, this gives me a little bit of hope that, you know, the work that we're doing to relocate these birds um, does have some long-term long effects. So that's, that's some hopeful news. So in summary, for this part of the study, we really did find that the relatively low cost of doing these re relocations, um, a lot of these facilities will um, use staff time. This is their job is to just help um, mitigate any type of wildlife um, on the airfield, um, but then some also use volunteers to help get their birds to other facilities where they can be um, assessed for their health and then relocated. So this overall like low cost of the relocation coupled with this high success rate, that 67% uh, success rate, um, we think that that may, might be a better management and conservation tool than, of course, no mitigation efforts. Um, and then the really bad side of it is the lethal measures. Um, and so we think this is especially true for a large high-risk species like the snowy owl. So I also wanted to highlight some of the work from one of the students I co-supervised at McGill, Andrea Brown. Um, Andrea did her undergraduate thesis with us and just got really excited about looking at the spring movements of snowy owls and using some of um, our tracking data um, at Project Snowstorm, as well as one of our collaborators out in Saskatchewan. And Andrea wanted to see if the migration phenology differed among the sex and age classes. And she also wanted to see where stopovers were occurring, because one of the, the things we're often wondering is how does a snowy owl determine what is a suitable breeding habitat? How does it know where to go in the Arctic that's going to be good for breeding? Like we said, they, they're highly dependent on the lemmings in the, uh, in the summer. And so how can they tell when there's going to be good lemmings? So we thought maybe the owls would be stopping over to assess a habitat and then determine, yeah, this looks good. I'm going to breed here. So in this collaborative study, we actually found that the majority of stopovers were occurring at the beginning of migration compared to the end, suggesting that snowy owls are not really using uh, stopovers to select their summer breeding sites, but instead are using them like a lot of the other species to rest and feed on migration. And so we also found that adults completed migration earlier than immatures. And so in this figure here, there's just a breakdown um, of the start and end time of migration. So we can see adults here 
on average started to move north around the 7th of April and then arrived at their breeding or summer sites um, around the third week of May. In comparison, immature started a little bit later, um, kind of <laughs> had, to, had to wake up and, and stretch their wings and get ready for, for migration. Um, and they ended up not settling until the middle of June. Of course, there's no real rush to get up north. You're not breeding um, as, a, as a second year owl. Um, so you don't have to kind of uh, be in so much of a rush as the adult. And then we also just wanted to see if there was any difference between males and females and not a huge difference there. So I would encourage you, if you wanna learn any more about Andrea's undergraduate thesis, um, it was published in the Journal of IBIS uh, back in 2021, and there's a lot of good gems in there. Um, and I always like to, to show this really cool little graphic that she made showing um, the migration of snowy owls as they head north. Um, there have been so many amazing folks who have contributed to this research, um, including the long list of uh, core Project Snowstorm team members. Um, this list continues to grow when we get, you know, more enthusiastic collaborators. Um, each of these members volunteers their time, um, and because of this passionate group um, of collaborative people, we've been able to accomplish quite a bit in the past 11 years. Um, Project Snowstorm is solely funded by tax-deductible donations made by our supporters and donors um, who allow us to continue doing this really important work. So as we think about the future and more things to study, um, we do have a study that we're cur is currently in the works, um, including this one here, which is an effort led by the International Snowy Owl Working Group, um, where myself, along with 38 other snowy owl researchers from around the globe, and this is including researchers um, uh, from Project Snowstorm, um, we're basically using tracking data, genetic studies, long-term breeding uh, bird data, um, all this information to assess the snowy owl population and their status and trends. So as I mentioned before, um, and for those of you that know, um, snowy owls have just really interesting behavior. Um, they're nomadic, they're eruptive, um, they breed in the Arctic tundra where there's not as many people, they become more challenging to monitor. And so um, the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, within the last couple of years actually uplisted them from least concern to vulnerable based on some population estimates um, that were done. And we're trying to take all of the science and all the information we have and say, well, what's really going on with the population? And are they increasing or should they still be vulnerable? Um, so we're currently, um, that uh, publication is currently undergoing revisions in the Journal of Bird Conservation International and will hopefully be published later this year. So be on the lookout for, for that. Project Snowstorm also has this incredible team of wildlife vets um, that have been looking at the health and contaminant issues in both live owls that we trap, um, but also salvaged owls, so birds that are brought in uh, for necropsy. And currently, I believe there's over 400 snowy owls which have been necropsied, um, looking at overall health, disease, and toxicology. And um, currently Project Snowstorm and a few collaborators are in the process of preparing a major analysis for publication. Um, so stay tuned to that. And, and this is looking at, you know, rodenticides, lead, um, pesticides, um, anything that's coming up um, from doing these necropsies. And so we're gonna summarize all that and put it in a publication and share that um, with the community. And in addition to refining our work and testing our recommendations for airport translocations, um, we're also interested in using telemetry to test um, the behavior and survival of rehabilitated owls. Um, this is something that the rehab community is, is really eager to learn. Um, we wanna know if we're investing all these resources um, into uh, rehabilitating an owl, is it going to survive in the wild once it's released? So really interesting question. And we have a fabulous uh, collaborator up in Quebec, Dr. Guy Fitzgerald. He's already permitted to do this work and um, will hopefully have the chance to tag a suitable candidate uh, at his rehab facility sometime this winter um, or sometime in the near future. And because Snowstorm is entirely publicly funded, um, we do our best to keep engaged with our supporters. Um, it's just really important, just as the science we do, but also the education and the communication. 
Um, our website is filled with really great information, including interactive tracking maps, um, an educational blog that's crafted by the brilliant and eloquent Scott Widensall. So I really encourage you to check out the website, um, look around and, and, and learn more about uh, the work we're doing over at Project Snowstorm. You can also find these really cool eye-catching infographics that we created with the help from Fuse Consulting. Uh, this first infographic here talks about eruptions and why we sometimes see owls this far south in winter. Um, again, there was a lot of topic, you know, owls are coming this far south, they're starving, they're dying, you know, what's going on? And with our research and the science we're doing, we were able to determine that that's not the case. And so we wanted to summarize that and put it in this really nice little package um, so that people can, can stay informed. And we also have the second one that focuses on snowy, uh, snowy owl health and etiquette for observing owls in the wild. Um, the really cool thing about both of these infographics is that they're on our website, so you can find them there. Um, but we have this feature that allows you to download them as either a PDF or a JPEG on your computer or your mobile device. So this means you can um, share this on social media or with your friends and your family um, and help us continue to spread the word um, about our research and educating others about the snowy owl. And I kind of like to wrap up and, and bring this uh, point up because as a biologist and someone who cares deeply about nature, I am constantly reflecting and asking myself, what can I do or how can I help um, when it comes to taking care of the environment and the species that inhabit it? And um, because, you know, one of the things we, we can do that's really important um, that maybe we don't really think about is give owls their space. Um, often we're so captivate, captivated by this Arctic visitor that we sometimes forget how our actions and our presence can influence the behavior of the owl. Um, we often see that, you know, with, with the birders and the photographers and everyone kind of comes around and maybe the bird's flushing and it's moving from, you know, perch to perch. Um, I think when you're, you're viewing, you know, any species kind of take note of what your presence is doing. Is it changing the behavior um, of, of that animal that you're watching? And, and if it is, maybe step back and come back another time and, and you know, appreciate it um, in the wild and, and don't disturb it so much. Um, another thing you can do is educate others about the importance of owls um, and their role in the ecosystem. Uh, just your enthusiasm and your excitement talking about them and sharing that knowledge with others, um, I think in turn does protect these birds and, and gets people um, to care a little bit more. Um, you can also support your local rehab facility. Um, these are the people that are caring for those sick and injured owls. So helping in any way that you can is, is really, really great. And finally, um, you can support organizations just like Hawk Mountain and Project Snowstorm that have ongoing research and public engagement like Connecticut Audubon um, that are trying to find ways um, in which to conserve snowy owls and other wildlife. And I'd like to just say that this research is highly, highly collaborative. Um, so a huge thanks to everyone who contributed, including my supervisors, Kyle Elliott, Karen Weeb, Jill Gauthier, um, everyone at Project Snowstorm, all of the funding sources, the banders, um, anyone who has supported Snowstorm and Snowy Owl research over the years. I would say that I am very fortunate to have joined the team back in 2017 when so much of this work was already underway. And I'm grateful to everyone listed here, um, as well as all the other collaborators and donors who share um, their same love and passion for this enigmatic species. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I saw questions were slowly coming in. I was I was shocked. I think you were hitting everything. Uh, any question that folks had to ask, you already were answering them. Um, but I'll get the ball rolling with just one that I have here. Uh, in your research, do you happen to know the average lifespan of a wild snowy owl? Oh, yes. Um, I think the bird banding lab had the oldest one just under, was it under 30 years old? Now I might be confusing it with a bald eagle. Um, it's, it's well over 20 years. Wow. Yeah, I think so for the, for the banded one. 
But yeah, we it, it, it's really challenging to get that information with when you think about tracking devices, they have a shorter lifespan. Um, so we really have to depend on um, banding data. And again, this isn't a species that you're, many people are capturing. Um, we do have a really good network here with banders and collaborators, um, but we, we do need you know, that long-term data to, to help answer those questions, so. Thank you. Yes. So I'm gonna jump in here. Hi everybody, it's Tom Anderson from Connecticut Audubon. I've been scrolling through the questions and I'm gonna feed them to um, Rebecca and Stefan. And the first one, not the first question, but the first one that I'd like you to answer is um, Isaac Tate, who is a fairly new member of Connecticut Audubon, writes that his seven-year-old son is wonder wondering if you have any audio of what a snowy owl sounds like. Um, and if not, where where might he be able to find it and listen to it? Yeah, I, I I think if you just go into Google and put snowy owl sound, um, I think the Merlin app the Merlin app might have it too. That I have I have one queued up right here, ready to go. Oh, look at you, you're ready. I saw it come in. I thought it was a great question. I'm excited to get, see people's reactions. I don't know if folks are able to hear that at all. So um, another question from, I think it's from Brenda Rich, who was, um, who for a long time has been one of our Osprey Nation observers. Um, but Brenda says for repeat offenders, in other words, the, the, the birds that have been returned to an airport after being relocated, has ever, anyone ever considered taking them captive somehow in a somewhat protective custody, but in a non-human contact situation like a tracking tower, like a hacking tower until it's time for them to migrate north again? To my knowledge, that has not been done. Um, that's a pretty invasive way of sort of, um, yeah, managing their their movements. I think we know that some owls are going to go back and use the airport, um, but we don't want to keep them, you know, from interacting in the wild in that sense. And so um, we do have some tests that are going on where if we keep the owl overnight, let's say, um, and see if, you know, if you hold the owl for 24 hours, uh, we're all, we're permitted to, we have permits to do this and, and it's okay, the owl's fine. It's, it's not, you know, um, in any danger, but we, if we hold it, you know, will, will it be less likely to return? So we're, we're trying different things to see if that influences um, time of year. There's a lot of people who think if you relocate an owl in early winter, the chances of it coming back are gonna be much greater. Um, we sometimes see even if the relocation is successful, um, on their way back north, they'll kind of use the uh, airport as a quick stopover. So um, maybe they won't be spending the winter there, but you know they'll come in for a meal before they head up north. So there's no one size fits all for for a solution. Um, you know we're talking. There's other studies with red-tailed hawks where they say they've tested that if you leave the you know a pair on site and you don't uh, relocate them, it actually reduces the number of red tails coming in over time. So there's this theory of like, what if you had some of the dominant birds stay? Could that in theory reduce the number of owls on the airfield and in turn, you know, reduce the number of strikes? And so, um, you know, this this is the study we did and we published just sort of just scratching the surface. And I think it's quite complex when you look at the different airports, their habitats, the location, eruption year versus non-eruption year, the number of flights on the runways. Um, it's it's it really um, is is challenging to tackle. And so I think, um, you know, ideas like that are, are definitely, you know, worth talking about and seeing if, if there is a, a solution that that works for all. But um, that has not been something that we've we've talked about. Um, so no, next question from um, someone whose last name I don't know, Dottie. Of all the owls in Connecticut, what percentage of the of those are snowy owls? Um, and can they be spotted? before dusk. I see Connecticut Audubon Society photos taken and it seems like in the daylight. So I, so that's a question of basically how common are they in Connecticut compared to other owls and are they diurnal or nocturnal? 
Yes. So I would say they're common uh, in those eruptive years. So when, you know, those happen every three to five years. So you're not going to necessarily see an owl every winter. Um, I think I checked eBird. You have no current sightings of any snowy owls this year. So your chances of seeing one this year are not, not looking good at this point. Um, so, and Connecticut's fairly forested. It's a smaller state. Um, again, these birds like open um, fields and grasslands, open habitats, um, not very many trees. And then of course the coastlines are great habitats for them. So I think you have better chances of you know, driving over to New York, uh, maybe up in Maine in some areas uh, to see them or during those eruption years, you'll definitely see them. Sure. I think you have a greater chance of, of catching some of your other owl species compared to a snowy. Um, but I would say when you do have snowies there, you can spot them day and night. Um, you'll often see them in the daytime roosting. So maybe they're on a telephone pole or perched on a silo or, you know, a roof. Um, and then the chances of seeing them at night become more challenging because, of course, us out, you know, trying to bird at night, you can't do that with your binoculars. Um, but you have a good chance of seeing them during the daytime because they really are this like bright white owl. Um, and even with snow, like they just they kind of just pop a little bit more than than the snow does. So great. So, Stefan, um, compared to snowy owls, what are the what are the more common owls in Connecticut? Uh, I would say our two most common owls that we have here are going to be the great horned owl and barred owl. Uh, the great horns are actually courting right now. So that might be the one that you'll hear in the backyard or if you have your window cracked or um, take the dog out at night. Um, the male and females are doing a, a courtship right now. Um, but the barred owl, which oftentimes um, is confused for a snowy owl, that's going to be the one that you're going to see the most of the time in the backyard or sitting on the fence post or at the bird feeder. Um, they can often appear very, very light. Um, almost white sometimes, especially in the snow. Um, but yeah, those will be our, our two most common owls that we have here. So um, Susan Myers had exactly the same question I did. How do you trap a snowy owl? <laughs> yes. Um, so there's different ways. Um, one of the active ways we have, um, like all of our raptors, right? It's a bird of prey. It hunts live animals and live prey. Um, sometimes it scavenges but we'll use uh, what we call a phi trap. And it's basically kind of like a, a rounded trap that has nooses on it. And we'll have um, a, a hamster in there or a mouse or something, um, it's protected. So actually when the owl comes in, it's thinking it's going to um, be able to catch its meal, but instead it gets caught in one of the nooses and we're able to run out where they're watching the entire time, um, run out and safely retrieve the owl, um, get it at hand, and then um, again, safely put the, the mouse or hamster away and start processing the bird. Um, there's various traps you can use. Again, on the breeding grounds, it's different than the wintering grounds. At the airports, they have um, other types of traps that they're using as well. Um, but uh, this stuff has been tested um, by many researchers over the years. And, and even then, we're always constantly thinking like how to improve it, how to make it better. Um, but, but that's just one example of, of how, we, how we trap them. So as, you, as you're talking, we now have 18 new questions. So we, <laughs> we might need to move it along a little bit. Um, are, they, are they susceptible to bird flu? Do you, does anybody know? Yes, so we've had some documented with um, avian influenza for sure coming in um, the recent uh, outbreak. Um, these birds feed on waterfowl, um, so it's not great for that. We're not really sure the impacts, um, especially um, from, from uh, avian influenza recently. Um, we've had some birds come in, um, definitely uh, killed by that, but then once winter ends and the birds go north, then they kind of go into that dark zone and we don't know. And this year at Project Snowstorm, we were kind of nervous wondering, you know, the birds that we have transmitted, they should be coming back south. We should get a ping saying they're back. And it just was silence up until I think it was last week, two of our, our birds that are transmitting came, came back south again. And so that's good news because we were sort of fearing that as the birds were migrating north and they were feeding on possibly infected waterfowl that um, they weren't going to survive. But we we really just don't know um, the full impacts of that, but it, it, it is killing them, unfortunately. Um, here's a question that refers to one of the photos in your, in your presentation. Are the 70 lemmings surrounding the owl legs dead or alive? Are they, and, and if they're alive, are they waiting to eat the newly hatched owls? 
Um, they are very dead lemmings. Um, yeah, that that is a busy um, male and female parent owl uh, just hunting like crazy. And it, it's something that, yeah, I'm sure was probably just um, mind boggling for the researchers to see. My colleague was there when it happened in that big eruption year, the 2013-2014 eruption he was up in the arctic monitoring hundreds of snowy owl nests and you know saw that and it just is is kind of incredible and reminds you like there's such good hunters um when when there's food like that and so um i'm sure those those little owlets were nice and plump <laughs> all summer long um and that's really important research too because up up before hearing about that and getting those photographs those visuals Uh, a lot of people were starting to think that the reason why these snowy owls were coming down here is because it was a it was a bad year, that there was something going wrong, um, that they were indicating that there was an issue. Um, and it turns out it's the complete opposite. It's actually they're doing quite well in those years. Right. And I'd like to add that that's sort of why we made that infographic, too, because we still get that right. And, and information sometimes doesn't travel quickly and, and you know, people have their ideas But we are trying to share that because even when we're trapping the owls, um, all of the banders across the U.S. and Canada that are just trapping these owls, you know, to put bans on them and collect, you know, that that information are finding that a lot of the birds aren't starving. They're actually in really good condition. So that's really reassuring for us as the researchers to know that, you know, the owls mm -hmm. out there are doing well, but the owls that are coming into rehab facilities, of course, usually aren't doing well. Right. So just to kind of give you that comparison. So to your point, it's it's this it really important research um, and useful for us to know. Um, why should when when there are, when there are owls around, why should people not get too close to them? What's the risk? Yeah, the risk is really disturbing the owl. Um, if you think about it, maybe you're going to go see an owl and um, it's next to an, a highway, right? You got word that there's an owl perched um, at this barn, but the barn's right next to the highway. And maybe you and 50 other people want to see this owl and somebody decides they want a really good uh, picture of the owl. So they start encroaching on it, encroaching on it. And then the owl, of course, does not want to be approached by humans takes off, starts to fly, they fly low to the ground. And what if it crosses that highway? And what if on that, that you know, on that highway, a truck's coming? And like, so I think it's things like that to just think about that you are impacting the bird and its natural behaviors. And even then, if you're there and you're disturbing the bird and it has to continue to move from perch to perch, that's like somebody waking you up every 20 minutes while you're sleeping and going like, hey, hey, you know, so like the owls are roosting, they're sleeping, they're trying to rest. We want them to be successful at hunting and surviving in the winter. So if humans are constantly um, approaching them, then then that may be impacting them. And, and we really don't know the, the overall impacts of that. We can just see from our tracking data and as well as observations in the field that um, sometimes when people just get a little too close, it really does push the birds and can can put them in dangerous situations that we just don't want to do. Stefan, you have anything to add to that? You've been you've been around birders and 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 birds on the coast a lot. Yeah, it's oftentimes very frustrating to uh, come across an instance like that where you have um, some folks who and, and you know honestly it's a lot of it's ignorance and I don't say that in a negative way. It's just not knowing exactly what you're doing to this bird. And I think uh, talks like this are very informative uh, to let folks know exactly the impact that uh, they will have on that bird. You know they are phenomenal hunters and great predators, but. Oftentimes in these eruption years, you know, it's cold, it's snowy, there's not a ton of food around. These birds are, are um, going to be increasing their calorie intake um, if they're going to keep moving from perch to perch. It's going to be a little more difficult for them to survive. So I echo that. Please uh, practice appropriate field craft. And if you ever have any questions uh, on how uh, to uh, uh, practice better field craft, I'm always available. Please shoot me an email or join us on our bird walks. Um, I often try to, to share best practices as well. We, we also have on our website a um, web post that I adapt, adapted actually from Project Snowstorm. Um, I did this, I think, in early 2018 or 2019 when barred owls were being seen over the place, all over the place. How to behave when you're watching a barred owl. Um, you can Google that. It's still one of the most popular things on our website. People uh, uh, look it up all the time. And I kid you not, I have a barred owl calling outside my window right now while you were talking about it. Is that it. right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, a, a woman named Linda, who says she's new to birding, relatively new to birding, wants to know what is the importance of owls? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a, a loaded question there in the sense that like owls, just like any other species in the ecosystem, they have their role. And owls in particular as a predator, um, when we just think, I don't know if you remember learning in school of like the bottom up, the top down, you know, like how that how everything is linked together. And when you think about taking owls out of an ecosystem, what does that do to their prey population, right? Um, maybe all of a sudden we have way more rodents. Um, and so we need those predators to keep things in balance. Um, and owls are spectacular predators and really good at, at helping um, us keep the, the ecosystem in balance. So even if you're not a, you know, a birder or you even really care about, you know, the fine details of what the species is um, or these species are doing, um, they have really important roles um, that, you know, are just, yeah, you know, just very general and 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 are important uh, in keeping our ecosystems healthy, which in turn keep us healthy. Terrific. So here's a question from Sylvia Halkin, who a lot of people in our organization know. She is a um, biology professor, actually, at Connecticut State University, and she says, um, fantastic talk. Snowy owls seem to have giant areas of scapular feathers between back and wings, as seen in your photo of a dead owl with its wings outstretched near the end. Any ideas of their function, keeping them warm in winter in an otherwise thinly feathered area when perched, like a, like acting like a shawl over their shoulders? Yeah, that's that's probably a, a really good um, hypothesis there. Um, I've I've handled snowy owls. I've handled them in very well below freezing weather, um, high winds, and when you put your hands on them, oh my gosh, it is just like this warm, wonderful, <laughs> lovely. Like they are well insulated, and and they're one of the species I've put transmitters on other species as well. And you really just have to work through all of their feathers, and so um, it makes sense that these birds are are really um, have a have a really nice plumage and tons of feathers to keep them warm. Uh, think about also wintering in the Arctic right now um, at this time of year when it's pitch black um, and you have those high Arctic conditions that, um, yeah, you you need uh, good, good, good feathers for that. Another benefit of being a, a research biologist is you get to use snowy owl hand warmers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I've never thought about it like that, but I'm going to use that. <laughs> um, so many of the things that I thought here were, qu were questions are actually um, thank yous and great job and nice presentation. I won't read them all, but there are a lot of them. Uh, um, a, a question from uh, Frank Matlick, who is um, a longtime birder in Connecticut. He's on our regional, the regional board of our Mil Milford Point Coastal Center. He says, this is obviously an off year for snowy owls migrating down to Connecticut. Where are the closest birds to Connecticut this winter? Um, when I last checked on eBird, there was some in New York. I think there was a couple of sightings in Northern Maine. And then of course, if you head to the Lake Ontario um, region, you can normally find wintering owls. Um, I always, uh, Amherst Island is probably a location many of you birders have heard of. Um, I've been in I visited Amherst a couple of years and my first year visiting, um, you know, there were 26 snowy owls on a very small island. Um, and so um, those those kind of places, again, um, in southern Canada, northern U.S. are, are good spots to to see out owls. But this year, I, I think the, the closest one was New York and Maine. And Stefan, maybe you're looking at that right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I was uh, pulling through some of the other comments and uh, questions okay. here. No, I, I, I echo that. As far as I know, those those are the closest snowy owls that we have here. There was one unconfirmed report um, in Connecticut this year, um, but that was potentially a barred owl. I, I want to ask a question that has to do with something Connecticut Audubon is involved in, uh, in um, at the state capitol in Hartford, uh, and it has to do with second generation rodenticides. Do you know mm -hmm. if any of the necropsies have turned up evidence of, of those in snowy owls? 
Yes, yes. So we do have that. I don't have those numbers on me right now. But as I mentioned, um, our team is currently working on um, analyzing all of those data and putting it into a publication um, that, of course, we'll then share with the, the public and everybody else. But I, I, I don't know the, the concentrations levels and then and how many of the owls, uh, what percentage they're finding them. But yes, I do know that there's been some detections of that. Right. Okay. Um, when are snowy owls removed from airports for their own good or for airport safety or for both? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, I would say from probably the airport perspective, it's definitely human safety, right? Um, we're, we're getting in these, um, giant planes and taking off. And the last thing you want um, is to hit a bird and a very large bird like a snowy owl that can be um, really bad, um, just taking away the damage side of things, but thinking about um, human life. And so airports, um, especially a lot of the major airports have their own um, wildlife agencies that are there trying to um, remove wildlife and, and kind of push them off the airfield. And this is everything from snowy owls to flocking songbirds to coyotes and deer. And so, yeah, they, they have um, funds invested in, in folks coming and, and trying to keep wildlife away so that they don't, um, you know, impact uh, the flights and planes and the people on them. So um, I work with a, a great organization up in Montreal called Falcon Environmental, and they um, have a great program where they're relocating owls. And as I mentioned, they're working with one of the um, vets, uh, Dr. Guy Fitzgerald. And anytime they catch a bird, they have a volunteer take that bird and they, any raptor and transport it over to Guy. And Guy does a full health assessment, um, monitors the bird, checks, you know, to make sure there's no injuries and then we'll band it and release it. And so it's really great because they're working together in collaboration and collecting really important information on the birds um, and also giving them um, somewhere safe to um, be moved to, whether they choose to to stay there or not. But that's great. So it's at eight eight fifteen. We've been going a little more than an hour, and I think that I'm going to say thank you to Stefan, my colleague, for doing this tonight. And Stefan will be on Young Gift and the Wild about Birds with with um, Beth Amendola from Audubon, Connecticut, Connecticut, talking about keeping beach nesting birds. Um, safe. I think that's March 5th at around noon. Um, Rebecca, this was really great. Thanks for getting on. Um, I, I, I now, however, I'm going to um, reintroduce Joyce Lights, our executive director, who is going to, I have no doubt, thank you again and thank everybody else. So Joyce, it's all yours. Great. Rebecca, thank you so much. And Stefan, um, you know, great job on adding to it. The Snowy owls are so engaging and your information is so important for us all to understand on, on why they're important and why we're seeing them and why we can appreciate them. Um, we wanna thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate that you come out on, on the evenings and join us for these presentations. Our next presentation is February 15th with Diego Ellis Soto um, talking about um, birds and nature in Connecticut cities. Uh, this is a follow-up on another one of our State of the Birds articles, and we are really interested in um, hearing more about Diego and from Diego on what he's doing in in the urban cities in Connecticut to really track birds. Um, your support really does make these presentations uh, happen, makes conservation across Connecticut happen, and we cannot thank you enough. So everybody, have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night.